German security authorities warn about the possibility of sleeper sabotage malware. A botnet to rival Satori, this one called Hakai, continues to spread to new classes of router. SamSam ransomware remains dishearteningly successful. The U.S. Director of National Intelligence warns against foreign influence in elections. Facebook's former security chief says the midterms could be the World Cup of information warfare. And Silicon Valley comes to Capitol Hill, but without Google. And now a word from our sponsor, the upcoming Cybersecurity Conference for Executives. The Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and Navigant will host the event on Tuesday, October 2nd in Baltimore, Maryland, on the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus. The theme this year is cybersecurity compliance and regulatory trends, and the conference will feature discussions with thought leaders across a variety of sectors. You can find out more and register at isi.jhu.edu and click on the 5th Annual Cybersecurity Conference for Executives. Learn about emerging regulations and how the current cybersecurity landscape is changing as companies must adhere to these regulations and take actionable steps to become compliant. Check out all the details at isi.jhu.edu and click on the 5th Annual Cybersecurity Conference for Executives. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, September 5th, 2018. The head of Germany's domestic security agency, the BFA, noting extensive Russian and Chinese cyber espionage, yesterday warned against the real possibility of sleeper malware, destructive code installed into crucial systems well in advance of its intended use. Hans-Georg Maassen clearly had industrial control systems in mind. Germany has had some experience with cyber interference in manufacturing processes, and Maassen thinks this threat hasn't abated. The Hakai botnet has moved beyond its initial Huawei targets and now infests D-Link and Realtek routers. The botnet is growing, but the bot master's doing less crowing. The recent arrest of rival Satori's alleged bot master having evidently put the fear of the law into him. He had formerly been marked by his willingness to boast, not just to victims and fellow hoods, but to journalists as well. SamSam ransomware spreads largely unabated as victims continue to swallow its fish bait. Preventive measures are fairly well known and available. Regular secure backup, appropriate measures against phishing and sound basic cyber hygiene but the attacks continue to succeed. In October 2017, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued Binding Operational Directive 18-01, which intends to enhance email and web security for organizations within the federal government. There have been several deadlines and milestones along the way, and joining us to help explain where things stand is Robert Holmes, Vice President of Products at Proofpoint. So there are various uh, requirements of the of the BOD, and probably the least well understood, certainly at the point at which it was issued, uh, was DMARC or domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance, and that's really um, key to solving for email fraud. The BOD uh, was issued in October of last year, and uh, agencies were afforded a year to enforce the strongest policy of DMARC. With two months to go. We're about halfway there. Hmm. And what is the expectation? Are they going to make the deadline? Difficult to say. I think there will be a flurry of activity, uh, just as um, calling for the gate to to, to board your flight. There's a last minute panic when everyone rushes. Uh, What I would say is I suspect what we'll see is some of the smaller agencies will fail to meet the deadline. Um, So some of the largest agencies have been making great progress on this. Um, but the smaller agencies are lagging, and I think those people won't probably make it. And what is going on behind the scenes here? Why is it taking folks so long to get with the program? Uh, It starts with, um, it's not that well understood. DMARC um, is the most uh, recent of technologies that the BOD uh, requires people to deploy. Um, And that's really only kind of six years old. 
Um, that may sound like a long time, but it's, this is pretty techy stuff. Um, so I think, that first of all, it's not well understood. And if you were to care to understand it, there are some 300 pages of technical specs. Um, and then you actually have to understand that in the world of email, we're not always working on complete information. Um, so we're having to make best guesses in some, in some cases and fill in blind spots, um, which is both difficult uh, and risky because what's at stake here is uh, the deliverability of email. Um, really what DMARC is, it's a form of whitelisting. And uh, whitelisting is great, it's very strong. Uh, but unfortunately, if good email is not on that whitelist, it doesn't get in. Now, what are the teeth behind this? If, if folks fail to make the deadline, what happens? Uh, some wrists may be slapped. Uh, that's a good question. And I think actually uh, there is a general sense that uh, so long as you can uh, demonstrate best endeavors, that maybe um, uh, the DHS would afford agencies who were otherwise unable to meet the deadline a little bit of leniency. There may be a kind of a, a, call, a call in to see what's going on and why they missed it. But understand that um, just like uh, enterprises, uh, agencies have budgeting cycles um, and they have headcount constraints. And so this BOD 1801 rather came out of nowhere. Senator Wyden obviously had issued a letter indicating that um, he was hoping that it was going to happen. But it happened very, very fast. And some agencies just may not have been prepared for that and may not have been able to absorb the additional workload. So I think uh, there'll be some risk slaps. I can't imagine that there will be penalties or sanctions. Um, and then maybe the carrot uh, might be replaced with a bit of a stick. That's Robert Holmes from Proofpoint. U.S. Director of National Intelligence Coates said yesterday that the prospect of foreign interference with U.S. elections remains real and troubling. Facebook's recently departed security chief Alex Stamos was more direct. The U.S. elections risk becoming, quote, the World Cup of information warfare, end quote. Some of those concerns found their way into congressional hearings today. The U.S. Senate's Select Committee on Intelligence this morning questioned Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey about foreign influence, censorship, cooperation with repressive regimes, and other matters. Their concerns included Russian influence operations, with special attention devoted to the possibility of voter suppression, protection of personal privacy, the relative preference an American company might be expected to have for supporting American interests and the U.S. government over the governments of other countries where the company might operate, the suppression of hate speech and bullying, and the potential for legislation imposing liability on tech companies for the content that resides on their platforms. Facebook's Sandberg was clear on her company's intentions and described a defensively principled way of navigating content moderation without restricting expression, at least with respect to the challenge of weeding out disinformation. Facebook clearly intends to concentrate on culling inauthentic accounts from its service, that is, accounts that falsely represent themselves as belonging to anyone other than their actual owners and controllers. They've purged a number of inauthentic accounts recently and clearly find that easier than directly policing content. Their approach to fake news, fanciful stories retailed as fact, and political disinformation sounds as if it will harken back to traditional rumor control. When known false stories appear, put true stories beside them. Twitter's Dorsey gave similar answers, especially on inauthenticity, but his company's plans were less clear. He did note that bot detection remained a problem still only partially solved. More than one senator was at pains to point out that neither Twitter nor Facebook do business in China, both being blocked by that country's government. Facebook Sanders took the opportunity to say that the company declined to do business under conditions that would violate its values. A company that does do business in China and was conspicuously absent at the hearings is, of course, Google, which declined to send a comparably senior executive to testify and so was symbolically shamed with an empty chair. Google apparently offered their chief legal officer, but he was insufficiently senior to interest the committee, so Mountain View went unrepresented. Most of the senators, with both parties being represented among the critics, noted Google's absence with displeasure. Senator Rubio, Republican of Florida, was particularly scathing, 
characterizing the company's decision not to send a senior leader as arrogance. He also suggested it may have been cowardice, given the recent demonstration by researchers from the Campaign for Accountability that it's still easy for trolls to buy ads from Google. The Campaign for Accountability, a liberal, which is to say center-left good government advocacy group, sought to buy ads from Google AdWords, and they did so in ways that obviously impersonated a Russian troll account, down to borrowing images and content from St. Petersburg's notorious Internet Research Agency and linking to sites that have been publicly and officially identified as Russian-controlled. And for the low, low price of $35 and a 48-hour waiting period, the researchers got their ad approved. They also got 20,000 impressions and some 200 click-throughs, and they say Google never flagged them as a problem, which they say they clearly were. Google didn't like it. They said they have, too, now that they know, taken the politically divisive ads down, and that they're working on making AdWords better. They also call the thing a stunt and point to the donations Oracle has given to the Campaign for Accountability, with the suggestion that this is at least in part motivated by Oracle marketing. In addition to keeping trolls from buying ads, Google has also committed to clearing malicious apps from its Play Store. It's met with indifferent success here as well, according to reports in Bleeping Computer. The fight Google picked was a good one. They determined to go after tech support scams. The problem is the scammers have gotten good enough at handling their ads that they pass for legitimate and get right through Mountain View's filters. The moral here seems to be that content moderation is difficult and doesn't really lend itself to technical solutions. And as far as human solutions are concerned, when it comes to social engineering, of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing may be made. Now I'd like to share some words about our sponsor, FireEye. They're hosting their annual Cyber Defense Summit in Washington, D.C. from October 1st through October 4th. The first two days are devoted to introductory, intermediate, and advanced training. It's hands-on, small group, and interactive, and it's going to be conducted by some of the best in the business, FireEye's experienced cybersecurity experts. Check out the list of courses at summit.fireeye.com. But of course there's more, and you won't want to miss that either. The 64th U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine K. Albright, will be there to deliver the guest keynote. Her topic? Economy and security in the 21st century. And former Home Depot CEO Frank Blake will share what he learned from his company's 2014 data breach. Don't miss it. To learn more and to register, go to summit.fireeye.com. That's summit.fireeye.com. And we thank FireEye for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Craig Williams. He's director of Talos Outreach at Cisco. Craig, welcome back. Um, We wanted to touch today on uh, Remcos. Uh, Bring us up to date. What do we need to know about this? Well, Rimcos is another one of these, we call them gray area tools, where conceivably there is a legitimate purpose of it. It's basically a RAT, so a remote access Trojan. Uh, it allows people to do things like install key loggers, compile new binaries that would evade antivirus detection. Uh, they even tend to go one step further, and they even provide a dynamic DNS C2 system, which would make it much more difficult to detect, and even a, a mailing tool that can effectively be used as a mass mailer. So, you know, at a really high level, it's a botnet in a box. You know, if you needed to conceivably remotely manage a machine that had to have a payload that was avoided by antivirus to install a keylogger over something, say, like a phishing email, (laughs) and then use a dynamic DNS C2 to control it, conceivably it could have a legitimate purpose. (laughs) Right. Go on. Uh, But, you know, I was discussing this with some colleagues, and Matthew Olney, who I believe you've met, pointed out the fact that typically that kind of usage would come with a warrant. Uh, so, you know, it's it's this area where people have designed what certainly appears like something that could be used for malware, uh, and they sell it kind of semi-openly uh, with their real name in some cases or a very, very poorly hidden identity, like in this case. And it's one of those situations where we tend to find these and we look at them, and we're not saying that everyone's using this for malicious purposes. I, I think it's 
safe to say that a large number of people are using these for malicious purposes. Uh, we know specifically in this one, we've actually seen a reasonable increase in usage lately. The author built a new you know, GUI interface that was much more friendly to people, say, without experience. And as a result, we saw the numbers climb as blocks. So that's why we started looking into this. And what sort of things are you discovering when you dig into it? Well, it gets a little bit more uh, gray. <laughs> so there's YouTube videos of supposedly the author of the piece of software, or at least someone using that name, um, you know, trying to push people to use this and use the other tools they sell, like Octopus Protector, to basically encode the malware so that it can't be detected by AV or walking people through how to set up other parts of what conceivably could be a botnet. Uh, and so when it comes down to it, you know, it seems like this kind of thing, while there might be a legitimate use for it, it's really being used maliciously in a lot of cases. And when that happens, we just have to block those for our customers to protect them. I see. Now, is this is this a, a case? I mean, I, I it, you sort of remind me of uh, you know back in the old days, years ago, uh, when people started selling radar detectors. Which the you know the the use for a radar detector is uh, is so that you can speed. Uh, there were some states that tried to outlaw radar detectors uh, and, and did. You can't use a radar detector in Virginia, I believe. Is this a similar type of thing where uh, even though there might be legitimate uses for this, uh, we could find uh, law enforcement saying, hey, you know, we're going to come after you if we find you using this? Well, as someone with a radar detector, I want to say no. But, <laughs> you know, I, I got a new car, got a radar detector, uh -huh. you know, long story. Yeah. But just for safety. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. But Informational it's, it's uses funny. only. <laughs> right. You know, it's funny you say that because I was surfing along the internet today and I don't know if you remember from a couple weeks ago, but there was a similar piece of software called Luminosity Link. Hmm. Uh, very similar, designed to be a remote administrative tool for people who maybe weren't as computer savvy uh, and it would allow them to basically manage a computer remotely and it was widely advertised on malware forums much like Rimco's um, and the author had videos and things, much less Rimco's. Uh, and recently, it turned out that they were charged by the FBI, and I think today they pleaded out to some massively long sentence. Uh, and so what caught my eye on this, though, was really interesting, is this morning I was, you know, surfing Reddit, reading the news in the morning as one does, and I happened to flip over to legal advice, because, you know, it's one of those things I look at from time to time just mm -hmm. to see what's going on. And they have this weirdly worded FBI ask Google for my information thread. So you look at it, and at first, it doesn't really look like there's anything related. And then if you look at one of Reddit's mirrors, you know, one of the ones that mirror the comments that have been deleted, it turns out this thread is filled with people who actually bought Luminosity Link uh, and paid for it with PayPal using their Google account. Hmm. And so, you know, we don't know that this is what happened, but reading through it, I think a reasonable assumption is that a lot of these people were buying this type of gray area software. And as a result, that the FBI apparently investigated their Google accounts which I think is great. You know, I, I think this type of software that's clearly designed to cater more towards the attacker than, say, the pen tester or security researcher is something that should be investigated. Yeah, is, that is interesting. And, and does it seem in that, in that particular case, is the FBI going after, you know, the kingpin at the top? Well, I think they already got the kingpin. Yeah. So you got to remember, this was one of those sealed indictments. So basically all this happened a year ago. And so presumably, if they were going to go after people, they would have been arrested by now, much right. like the malware author. Uh, I'm assuming these people were just grouped in because who knows, maybe the FBI wanted to check to see if there was any overlap between the purchasing IP and attacker IPs or something like that. Right. Oh, interesting. All right. Well, as always, uh, it's an interesting story to follow. Craig Williams, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all the stories mentioned in today's podcast, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the Cyberwire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit silence.com. And Silence is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the Cyberwire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. 
Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.